Hello, good morning. It's Roberto Calabresi speaking from Kyoto Club. Good morning and welcome to all the attendees of uh, this uh, new uh, activity, the new webinar um, on uh, today uh, is, is uh, on energy, uh, clean energy uh, in two parts. The first part on uh, uh, energy efficiency and the second part on uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, I will present you know uh, in those slides you know what is the EU framework for energy efficiency and the strategies uh, which uh, are in Europe for several years now with a strong focus on the clean energy package and then uh, updates on what is the EU strategy for energy efficiency under the new EU Green Deal. Um, but maybe before starting, uh, since I, I have uh, around 20 minutes, uh, I will just provide a quick introduction of who Schneider Electric is uh, and who we are. So we are the leader in energy automation and digital solutions for energy efficiency and sustainability. Um, uh, so we are 26 billion euro turnover companies with a big fo uh, footprint uh, in Europe, as you can see on the screen. Our headquarters are in France, um, so the, the name Schneider on Germans, but it's 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 a French company uh, initially, uh, and now we are well represented in uh, all the world with again a big footprint in Europe. So j just a quick introduction of also where you know we see the world going. Uh, of course, you know to to limit uh, climate change, you know, and to make sure you know we become a, a carbon neutral world. We have uh, taken strong commitments to become carbon neutral by 2025 in our ecosystems. Um, and we see you know, the importance of accelerating energy efficiency improvements, boosting electrifications and decarbonizing energy sources. And in this regard, we've been uh, pretty active uh, in Brussels you know, to work on energy efficiency topics because it has appeared, you know, as one of the key elements of uh, the EU strategy to become uh, more uh, energy efficient and to ensure Europe energy transitions towards sustainable uh, economies. So now, um, talking uh, really um, more in details of uh, what we are going, what we want to discuss today about the EU framework for energy efficiency. So before starting these presentations, uh, please, um, uh, and Eugenio, uh, please interrupt me if there is any questions on the chat or if someone is not uh, hearing well, don't hesitate to interrupt me because uh, those uh, sometimes, you know, you, you, you don't stop in a presentation and I want to make sure that uh, everyone asks a question if there is something which is not clear in my presentation. So we are here today, you know, to discuss uh, energy efficiency framework uh, and strategies in, in Europe. So um, basically, the EU framework for energy efficiency uh, lies on four pillars, four main pillars. The first one is the energy efficiency directive. So this is a 20, 2012 uh, directive, which has been amended in 2018, and which sets rules and obligations for the EU for 2020 and for 2030 with uh, targets uh, to achieve energy efficiency. So the first target for the EU is to achieve 20% target for 2020. And the second is a mandatory target of 32.5% for 2030. And we will see next, you know, how the EU is doing in terms of achieving those targets. The second main pillar, very important uh, at EU level and, and um, is, is regards buildings. So as you may know, buildings in Europe accounts for 40% of ener energy consumptions and 36% of CO2 emissions. And actually, this, um, this, this sector is super important because today 75% 75 of buildings in Europe are not energy efficient. So if you know Europe wants to ensure its energy transitions, tackling the issue in buildings has uh, appeared as really critical. So today, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive is really the EU main piece of legislation to make buildings more energy efficient and to reduce their climate impact. So that's the second main pillar of the EU framework for energy efficiency. The third pillar is about eco-design and energy labeling. So I guess you all know uh, about energy labels, you know, which provide an indication of the energy efficiency products at the point of purchase. So for instance, in Europe, um, when you want to rate 
to rent sorry a, a flat you know you have an indications a b c d e of uh, the energy efficiency of the products or of uh, in the, in this in this case of the flats but it's the same case you know if you want to buy a television for instance and then then linked to this um, energy labeling you have the eco design which is you know one of a very important piece of legislations uh, from the eu which sets mandatory requirements and minimum standards for the energy efficiency of the products. And this encompasses a large range of products from lighting products to heaters, power transformers, freezing equipment, televisions, battery chargers. And uh, again, a lot of them, you have more than 30 lots uh, concerning those concerning EU products. And uh, this is basically, you know, requirements that the EU put on manufacturers, including Schneider Electrics, to make sure the products we sell on the market are energy efficient. And then the last pillar um, is about how you finance uh, energy efficiency. And um, I will leave mainly, you know, this, uh, this part, you know, to, to my colleague um, uh, from Schneider to describe, you know, how the EU is, you know, helping um, um, citizens, uh, communities and companies, you know, to do more in terms of energy efficiency. And we'll have good use case uh, at the end of, the, uh, after, the, after my presentations to showcase how the EU is trying to mobilize uh, investments for energy efficiency. And right now you have the use of EU funds, including Horizon Europe, but also the European Strategic Investment Funds, and more than 80 billion euros have, has been mobilized for energy efficiency between 2014 to 2020. So now, um, going into the details of uh, energy efficiency and what we have seen uh, in the past few years. So the energy efficiency concept has been really at the core of the clean energy package. So the clean energy package was the main piece of legislation from the previous commissions to ensure Europe transitions towards sustainable economies. Um, so it was a, a package of eight different legislative proposals, and one of them was uh, indeed the uh, energy efficiency uh, directive. So um, just I will go to this one later, but just um, uh, 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 an overview of what is the uh, energy efficiency directive. So the energy efficiency directive was first adopted in 2012. As I explained to you, it was setting a 20% target, but which were non-binding. The important part um, of uh, this directive, and you can see on the screen, and I will not detail, go into the detail of everything, but again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Um, so the, the, the main aspect of uh, this directive was that the EU countries were um, obliged you know, to set uh, energy efficient renovations of public buildings of at least 3% per year which means that all the buildings owned by uh, the national authorities, not the local ones, had to renovate the building stock of at, but at a rate of at least 3%. Today, this rate, this, this rate is not, has not really been achieved in all the countries, and that's actually one of the points of discussion at EU level to make sure we reinforce this rate. The second important element of this energy efficiency directive is mandatory energy efficiency certificates which must accompany the sale of and rental of buildings. So every time you sell or you rent a building, you need to make sure you do an energy performance certificate which assess the energy performance of your building. Uh, the third really important aspect is the rollout of smart meters for electricity of 200 million meters smart meters by 2020. Uh, this uh, rollout has been quite effective in some countries, such as Italy, but today, uh, again, Europe is a bit lacking behind in achieving these targets. And the fourth super important uh, aspect is about the obligation schemes for energy companies. So this directive sets obligations for all energy companies, including utilities, to achieve yearly energy savings of 1.5% sorry, of annual sales to final consumers which means that every year they need to achieve 1.5% energy saving. And then the last very important point of this directive is the obligations for companies to conduct energy audits every four years or to uh, deploy energy management systems to assess how energy efficient their company is. Today, these audits um, are deployed, but mainly on, on a not very... Um, good basis since uh, the, uh, the quality of the audit has been questioned by a lot of studies 
And this is one of the points uh, the EU is considering to improve the energy efficiency of the companies. So since uh, this framework, you know, was was not up uh, to, to date with the, the the ambition of the EU to become a leader in climate neutrality and to uh, improve the energy efficiency of the continent, the EU has revived as part of the clean energy package I was mentioning this framework in a proposal of the Commission in 2016, which has been adopted in 2018. Very important point of this directive is the fact that the EU is now setting a 32.5 percent binding target for the EU, but not for member states, which means that the uh, member states together must achieve uh, uh, this 32.5 percent binding targets, but they are not required you know, to have the same level of energy efficiency in each member state. The second important element is the extension of energy savings obligations. Um, actually, the ambition has been a bit decreased there because the obligation is not of 1.5% anymore, but 0.8% until 2030. Um, interesting element is that the metering and billing um, of consumer has been increased with more requirements for the deployment of meters and district heating. And then important element also for um, the accelerate of electricity in heating and cooling since, as you know, electricity is the cleanest uh, vector of energy uh, in the world, and is the fact that they have uh, updated the primary energy factor for electricity generation, which is kind of a push for electricity for heating and cooling. So that's a, a quick overview of, um, of the, the new EU framework we have today for energy efficiency directive. Um, and uh, important uh, to show you that right now, the EU is not on track to uh, achieve the energy efficiency 20 targets. They are even quite far behind. They are 5% uh, behind you know, the ambitions to reach the targets. Um, and it's a bit, of course, a, a shame for the Europe, which want to become an energy efficient com continent. So energy consumption basically had been gradually decreasing since the beginning of the century, but this trend has changed in 2014. So as a result, Europe, consumer, co Europe consumes today more energy today than when the 2020 target was adopted in 12, 2012. And we're even 20% away from achieving the 2030 targets. So that's uh, something which is um, really concerning, uh, as we will see uh, next, because Europe wants to achieve climate neutrality in 2030. And I will come back, of course, to this question of uh, achieving energy efficiency. Uh, then I wanted to focus this, this um, presentations on uh, the building stock, which is um, a very important uh, sector to address um, if Europe wants to ensure its energy transitions. Again, numbers I mentioned in the big, beginning of these presentations on how um, important uh, the building consumption is and how important it was for Europe to address energy efficiency. So, um, as, uh, sorry, sorry, there is a bit of mistake of this slide, but same as the energy efficiency directive, the EPBD was part of the new uh, clean energy package. So you had the previous uh, per energy performance of buildings directive in 2010, which were setting requirements for the building performance uh, and for the building codes. Uh, and which was, was mainly focusing on the passive solution, so the envelope side. And now this new directive has been focusing much more on the active energy efficiency technologies. So basically, when you, you take a, a buildings, you have different uh, layers, as you, as you know. You have the, the, the passive side and also the active side. And you need both, you know, good envelope, good insulation of the building, but also good technical building system functioning well with automation and controls to make sure you can uh, reduce the energy consumption of the buildings, improve the comfort and cut greenhouse gas emission of the buildings. So that was the main uh, uh, elements of this revised DPPD. Uh, so the first is the fact that uh, all large non-residential buildings must be equipped with building automation and controls by 2025. The second important element is on the acceleration of self-regulating device to control the room temperature control. Third important element is on the smart readiness indicator. So the EU is currently 
um, developing uh, an indicator to raise the smart readiness of buildings at EU level. And third important point, which is different to energy performance, which was about immobility. So the Commission wanted to, and the EU then wanted to, to accelerate the deployment of immobility by putting requirements for EV charging station, electric vehicle charging stations, mainly cabling infrastructures, uh, in new buildings and those undergoing major renovation. So that was this new framework of the EPBD. Uh, and actually, the EPBD uh, has been adopted in 2018, and the deadline for member states to finalize the implementation is in less than one month, which means that by March 10, member states will have to finalize the EPBD transposition. So, very good uh, improvement with this EPBD, which we know has paved the way to make sure buildings become more energy efficient. But um, the, the reality is that now the Europe has taken new ambitions for uh, climate neutrality. So I don't know how much you heard about this new European Green Deal. So um, we, since uh, 2007, uh, 2019, sorry, we have new in EU institutions and a new European Commission president, Ursula von der Leyen, which has announced a European Green Deal to achieve climate neutrality by 2025 by uh, 2050. So Europe now wants to become the first climate neutral continent on the planet. And basically to achieve this, you don't have much choice. You need to increase the energy efficiency actions, the ambitions to make sure we deliver on climate neutrality. And as I was explaining you uh, in uh, the previous slides, and I will show it again, because this is really important if you want if we want to understand the strategy, but also how the EU is delivering in terms of energy efficiency um, uh, actions, is that the EU right now is really far away from meeting their its 2020 and 2030 targets. So on one side, um, the EU will, you know, if the EU wants to become climate neutral, climate neutral by 2050, will have to increase its energy efficiency ambition but also the member states will need to make sure to deliver first on the 2050 and then the 2030 target. So as part of this Green Deal, the EU will first in March, so next month, um, uh, start, uh, so the, the Commission will propose a, a, a regulations probably, which is called the climate law, to ensure climate neutrality into law. So the EU will set its goals to become the first zero carbon continent on the planet. And to achieve this, it will also revise, probably by June 2021, so next year, its uh, 2030 climate targets, including the energy efficiency targets. And from discussions we had here in Brussels, uh, and I, I had with members of the, of the with uh, representatives from the European Commission, they uh, acknowledged that they will have to increase the 2030 targets. So we expect a big fight, if I can say, here in Brussels between the different institutions and the commissions who want to become climate neutral. So the member states will have to increase their ambition in terms of energy efficiency. And I have uh, provided here a slide which uh, show you a bit, you know, the upcoming EU initiative as part of the EU Green Deal. And here you can see on the screens um, for June 2021, uh, a revision of the energy efficiency directive which is where you know the EU will probably is increase its EU targets for energy efficiency. So um, uh, in a nutshell, this is the, the main EU framework for energy efficiency. I've been focusing mainly on the energy efficiency directive and the energy performance of buildings directive, which are the, EU, you know, the two main pillars for EU in terms of energy efficiency. Um, the second aspect, uh, the third aspect of course, is about eco design and energy labelings. And uh, fourth aspect about financing. So, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Francesco Martinelli. I'm work. Uh, I'm working as well from for uh, Schneider Electric, uh, but I'm located in Italy. So, I work for. Uh, the technical support in the construction building team. Um, so my main job is uh, to give support to clients on our technologies, uh, but in parallel to that, uh, uh, my team is carrying out uh, some uh, research project financed by the European Commission. So we're going to discuss about this framework today. 
and uh, the main focus that we are uh, um, exploiting on uh, this uh, um, research project is uh, sustainability and innovation. So I think it's very related to what was shown before and uh, the topic of uh, today's presentation. So the agenda of today, we're going to talk about uh, the framework Horizon 2020. So very brief introduction on, on what is Horizon 2020 and uh, um, our participation as Schneider Electric Italy. So we participate in this uh, research project uh, as a national entity uh, for Schneider. So there are also other Schneiders uh, in, uh, in Europe participating in uh, this project, such as uh, Schneider France or Spain. And then I'm going to um, final uh, finish my presentation with uh, one example of project, the project Thermos, which is going to finish uh, at the end of uh, this month. So you're going to get uh, some uh, uh, some preliminary results uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, show you a bit uh, what is the project about. What is Horizon 2020? It's a, a framework of, uh, of project that was started uh, in uh, 2014 and it lasted for, uh, for seven years. So Europe, uh, the European Commission wanted uh, um, a framework of financing to companies, industries, universities, SMEs that was big in size, so 80 million euros, that was easy to be accessed to funds, and that was leading to innovation and research. So these were the main pillars of this research project framework and financing. Um, so. A lot of money allocated to this, to this project for a, um, a long period. Um, as I said, the objective uh, was that to, to couple the research and innovation. So you don't participate in these projects alone, but you work with a consortium of companies. So uh, companies and universities collaborate together. So you bring together expertise uh, that are in the universities, in the research institutes, uh, together with the uh, technical knowledge of uh, technical partners and small enterprises. and. Uh, you try to tackle those uh, societal challenges uh, uh, such as uh, energy, uh, environment, uh, health, uh, IT, robotics uh, that are very important for Europe uh, as it is now. So a uh, very strong emphasis on science, uh, on industrial leadership uh, and uh, the final goal is to try to uh, break down those barriers uh, that are created by the single national markets in Europe uh, by linking together different companies uh, and the different uh, um, partners uh, that are all around Europe. So minimum requirements for these projects is uh, to create a consortium with the uh, three uh, different countries uh, represented in the consortium. So very um, looking forward to the uh, unification of Europe uh, as a single market as well. And, uh, in particular, to be to become the most strong market in the world for uh, knowledge, uh, research, and innovation. So, what are the factors uh, that are most important and the evaluation parameters in uh, the Horizon 2020 frameworks? So, every every approximately every six months, uh, um, the European Commission in the Horizon 2020 frameworks was releasing some uh, calls, uh, uh, so calls of proposal, so the companies could apply, and uh, the request for uh, this call was uh, to bring uh, forward ideas uh, that were innovative uh, in uh, application and the service solution offered, and uh, also these uh, uh, ideas need to be feasible all around Europe, as I said before, so to create a single market and a European context, uh, not only in a very specific uh, region or countries, uh, uh, but to be spread uh, all around Europe. And uh, also another uh, very important factor was uh, the sustainability. So all uh, the projects need to be financially um, capable of uh, going uh, alone once the project financing is finishing. So one project could, can last two, three, four years, but after that uh, time, the uh, European Commission wants uh, to ensure that uh, there are some exploitable results, uh, some outputs from the project that can be uh, positive uh, for all Europe uh, without uh, any more funding. Um, so these calls, uh, every time uh, we, together with some, with our partner, we submit a request of proposal. Um, these uh, these calls, uh, these proposals are evaluated on three different. Uh, um, topics. The first one is excellence. So how clarity and pertinent is the project that you are showing uh, compared to the objectives of the call? So 
one example, uh, we receive a, um, the European Commission present a, a call on uh, um, residential technologies. So we answer together uh, with uh, uh, other technology partner and university to this call in uh, 20 uh, in 2005, in 2015, 15, sorry, and. Uh, uh, so we answered with a, with a project, a structure project uh, on how to test uh, uh, upcoming technologies uh, in the framework of uh, different climates in Europe. Um, so European Commission evaluated this project with a high level of excellence uh, as uh, it was clearly responding to the objectives that were, were requested in the call. Then a second uh, important point is the impact. Uh, how the solution that you are presenting uh, to the European Commission in, uh, uh, as an answer to their call, uh, how is it going to impact uh, the uh, European market uh, in the next uh, uh, 10, 15, 20, 50 years? Uh, so very important to show number and expected impact uh, uh, related to the work program that you are presenting. And finally, the quality and efficiency of the implementation. So uh, being this a, a, a long time project that you need to show the European Commission that uh, um, your work is going to be sound and clear, that you already know what you're going to do, what uh, every partner is going to do and uh, uh, in which timing. So they also the timing is very important to be shown. OK, um, why is United Electric Italy participating in this project? Uh, so first of all, we want to develop uh, um, our applications uh, that are uh, uh, futuristic. So we have a framework where we can uh, test uh, this solution uh, um, to boost uh, energy efficiency and sustainability that then we can present on the Italian market, on the European market. Another very important point to participate in these uh, uh, R&D projects is uh, um, myself and my colleagues, uh, we joined Schneider starting with this project. So we have a very broad view on what the company is doing, both on technical side and on a commercial side and as a vision side. So we learn a lot and then we can move towards uh, other more strategic uh, objectives inside the company. Um, we also develop some uh, pilot cases. So we go in real buildings and in real application to test uh, what we are developing in these R&D projects. Uh, so they become uh, study cases and uh, um, synergic uh, showcases uh, for uh, the business uh, so for example we have a, a house uh, from a, from our from one of our partners here very close to our location in italy where we can bring we can uh, take clients to show our uh, domestic solution and finally we um together with our marketing teams here in uh, here in italy we use uh, the output of the projects uh, uh, for uh, dissemination and to show how schneider electric is uh, bringing forward uh, the concept of sustainability and uh, the um, the greener aspect uh, of the economy so some some key figures i'm going to show, show you some uh, key figures we started with these projects in uh, 2012 so 8 years ago we have completed approximately uh, we have completed the six uh, projects uh, uh, with very successful results uh, and uh, we have at the moment uh, six uh, projects uh, running um, so these are the projects that has been uh, funded so european commission uh, accepted our proposal the proposal we sent uh, together with our partners um, but behind that uh, there is a, a big work of uh, creating of uh, proposals uh, to the calls so for example in 2019 uh, we worked we worked on uh, 12 proposals uh, and we have the three of these uh, funded uh, so um, it's a uh, one out of four proposals submitted which is a very high success rate uh, for uh, this type of projects uh, um, in, in europe um, so about talking about numbers uh, we uh, we received in uh, in eight years uh, uh, more than 4.2 million euros uh, uh, funded um, funded by european commission directly and uh, which uh, includes uh, effort for more than 500 person months uh, uh, so myself and uh, my colleagues uh, were uh, receiving uh, um, uh, this uh, the, this money to carry out the work done uh, uh, in the projects So very, very briefly, in which part? So this is our ecostructure architecture. So ecostructure is a very important concept for, uh, for Schneider Electric. So we wanted to have a link between all the different strategic sector of the company and the different level of application in a, in a possible client or in a, plus, in a possible site. So 
in this eco structure architecture the european projects are mainly focusing historically on the building side with the two domain eco structure power and building so we bring forward solution of building automation and of power monitoring in the building sectors both residential and industrial as you will see later and for what concern the um, ecostructure industry. We applied the ecostructure plant uh, for uh, um, a project that we just uh, um, we just uh, won. Uh, so we just uh, get, uh, got funded uh, a project based on uh, um, digging and mining. So digitalizing and mining. Let's see the application segments. So we. We focus uh, all around the, the city with different projects. Uh, um, so we started uh, with the project on uh, on sport, so um, efficiency in uh, sport uh, uh, plants, uh, stadium, uh, gyms. So this was the the first project we participated. Then uh, we got project on uh, uh, healthcare, so hospitals and uh, a shopping mall. So how to make uh, uh, hospitals more efficient and how to make a shopping mall uh, more efficient and comfortable and secure for uh, the occupants. <clears throat> then uh, lately, we um, really focused uh, uh, our effort on uh, buildings and residential sector. So we had uh, four projects, three financed by European Commission and one financed by uh, the local region uh, where we are based here. and. Uh, here we applied a different level in the residential sector uh, our solution also projects related to the integration of the grid uh, so you all know about the uh, smart grids uh, uh, building energy monitoring uh, included in the, in the grid included in the city so these three projects uh, are really focusing on on this topic and uh, Finally, for what concerns the, the building aspects, uh, we also received uh, funded for a project uh, called Positive. It's a, a very recent one. Um, this is a project on smart grid. So we have two um, very uh, advanced cities in Europe, uh, which are representative of uh, the advancement of smart grids. And so we are bringing our uh, um, solution for uh, uh, renovation of historical buildings uh, in uh, these cities. And finally, finally, as I said before, uh, the first project we got for uh, industrial sector, the project Digit uh, on uh, mining and uh, digitalization of uh, uh, mining plants. So these are all the projects we, we have achieved, uh, and uh, some of them are closed, as I said before, some of them are running. Uh, um, the three on the left, uh, I become a positive and Digit, were just achieved this uh, uh, last year. So we are very, uh, very interested in the uh, working in this in this field, and we are putting a lot of effort in it. So let's uh, start with the the example of applications. So the project Thermos, as I said before. So here there is another video that is introducing the project. Uh, I will uh, I will describe it for you. Uh, Thermos was a, a four uh, is a four year project uh, uh, that is uh, uh, finishing this at the end of this month. The concept of Thermos was to make a house ready to be integrated in the district heating um, by the usage of uh, some uh, heat exchanger on a bidirectional way and uh, to test uh, in this uh, framework some new uh, new technologies such as uh, heat pumps uh, or micro chp which are boosting the possibility of uh, exchanging energy towards uh, the um, the district heating as it is uh, happening now with the photovoltaic for example so the houses uh, with the photovoltaics are no more only consumer but are prosumers so producer and consumers and we were studying how that will be uh, if that will be possible to do the same with heating uh, solution uh, when uh, there is a district heating so we'll leave the the link uh, to the video as well so the project was focused on uh, taking some technologies and installing in some different houses around Europe. So we choose uh, different demo sites in different climate location and uh, different typologies of buildings as well. We went from very small houses like uh, the one here uh, you're seeing in, uh, in Riga uh, to some uh, very big houses in UK or to a district in Spain. So for uh, the houses in uh, in Riga, uh, there were four different houses very similar close to each other. So we decided to install different technology packages in each uh, house to test the difference of uh, production and possible exchange to the district heating. 
So the first technology package that was uh, installed uh, was a micro CHP combined with a system of smart thermostatic radiator valves. Uh, so the micro CHP for uh, the ones you know, uh, who knows, uh, is producing at the same time electricity and uh, uh, hot water. So this could be um, could make a house uh, a prosumer, so both a producer and consumers at the same time for uh, electricity and heating. Uh, the second uh, case of application was a gas absorption heat pump uh, combined with a smart thermostatic radiator valve and uh, um, a gas boiler for uh, the domestic hot water during summer, while the third uh, technology package was uh, uh, an air source heat pump combined uh, with a domestic hot water tank and the smart uh, for a buffer and a smart thermostatic radiator valve system. So the, the houses were uh, <coughs> provided with uh, these technologies and uh, they were studied, uh, they all that the pre-existing gas boiler, very inefficient one. Uh, so for a certain period of time, we studied the, the uh, energy consumption of each building, and then uh, we changed the technology, and then we studied again uh, the energy consumption, and the results were um, were quite uh, quite good. We saw a very big, uh, as you can see on uh, the bottom left here, uh, for the different technology package, uh, we see we saw energy savings uh, up to 33% uh, depending on the technology package uh, and uh, very good uh, CO2 emission savings uh, um, and also a very important reduction of the gas consumption uh, on an annually basis. Um, in this case uh, due to the uh, optimization uh, which was done through the smart thermostatic valve system in the houses. So uh, combine we, we could the demonstrate uh, that a combination of technologies uh, is the most uh, efficient way to uh, to save energy inside the building and also to decrease the gas consumption uh, for for example in different uh, um, typology of buildings so this work that i'm showing now um, is focused on uh, the riga uh, residential houses the same uh, uh, analysis has been done for the district in spain and the, the two um, bigger building uh, in in uk and also results for those uh, those cases were really positive mm. as a schneider electric in this uh, project we participated uh, as a provider of a monitoring architecture because uh, as i said we were monitoring the consumption before and after the installation of the technology packages so we installed uh, a monitoring architecture based on uh, open protocols uh, in order to boost the replicability. And uh, we applied both for wired and wireless technologies uh, uh, and sensors. Uh, um, so you can see on the top, uh, connected to our automation server modules, uh, uh, weather station, electricity meters, heat meters, uh, which were the one that were measuring the real consumption from uh, in the boiler room, for example, while on the bottom, uh, we were also assessing the uh, thermal uh, quality, indoor quality for the environment uh, because it's easy to decrease the energy consumption, but you also needed to take care of uh, what is the air quality for the occupants of the buildings. And uh, all this solution um, was uh, installed locally and then was communicating through secure protocols to a central uh, server, which uh, uh, is based on our eco-structure building operation uh, technology. And uh, from uh, this uh, central server, we could uh, give data to the different uh, other partners. Uh, so we were putting in communication all the actors in the project, uh, um, adapting with a solution which is very easily adapt adaptable for small buildings or very big districts so we were getting that from different uh, type of uh, demonstrator and as i said before thanks to the usage of open protocols so the solution can be very easily replicated uh, to other uh, uh, to other places uh, in europe or in the world we also created a, a front-end interface for the users to check out uh, uh, what is the energy consumption at every time and the accumulated, for example, energy that they are consuming on over a period. So um, here are some, some examples, again, for, uh, for Riga. From uh, the boiler room, uh, you can see the total energy consumption, uh, the progressive energy consumption of the building. Okay, to, to final... To, to get to a conclusion for uh, for this um, <clears throat> what are the next steps um, and uh, let's make a focus on uh, what was the uh, today presentation um, in horizon 2020 turkey participated as a associated country so there are two type of countries uh, um, of figures uh, that are participating in a european project there are the 
um, resident countries and the associated countries. So for example, Italy uh, being part of the EU uh, is a resident country. Uh, while there are some uh, other additional countries who can participate, there is also, uh, for example, Canada for some project. Uh, and uh, Turkey did really well in their participation as uh, it was the fourth uh, out of 16 uh, associated countries for participation rank and budget share. Um, in total, uh, Tur Turkish companies, university, uh, universities, and research and, uh, um, and R and D institutes uh, got uh, approximately 177 million euros uh, net contribution from EU on these projects. And uh, to go to the future, the next, uh, um, when uh, Horizon 2020 will finish, it will start Horizon Europe, uh, which is an ambitious uh, 100 billion uh, R and D uh, program. Um, in which uh, participation of Turkey um, is uh, under confirmation now, so uh, stay tuned. And uh, I wanted to give this data in order to maybe raise some interest from uh, from the audience on uh, um, on the possible participation in this project, as uh, also Schneider Electric, but also Kyoto, Kyoto Club is participating in this project. So. Um, it's a very good way to get financed, uh, to finance uh, the R&D in, uh, in your company or uh, in your institution. And uh, it's also a um, very important uh, place where to learn uh, cooperation and, and to learn uh, how the market is going and uh, what is going to be the future of uh, um, European and global uh, uh, energy sector in particular or uh, building sector. Okay, these... Uh, this was my presentation. I apologize again for uh, not being able to show the videos. Um, I'm going to paste the videos in, uh, in the chat. Um, I hope uh, the, um, the presentation was interesting for you and uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to be available for, uh, for questions if uh, anybody from the audience has uh, some. Okay, Marco. Thank, thanks, thank, thanks a lot. It's Eugenio speaking now. Um, we have a couple of questions already from the participants. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, if you or Jules can answer, maybe you. Could you give more application examples for heat district with PV panels? Especially, I care more about high residential buildings applications. Uh, and the uh, participant thanks you for everything. And the other question is if you could share again your contact details. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, for myself, for the last question, I will go back to my initial slide, so you can uh, you can have my contact there. And I don't know if in the end you you wish to share the presentation uh, uh, with the audience. Uh, that will be. Oh, there are no contacts here. Okay. Yes, I will. Uh, I repeat. I don't know if Roberto already told the, the participants. By the way, the recorded videos of the webinars and the PPTs and the files will be available for free on the web page of the project on our web website on KyotoClub.org. Genio, maybe I can um, address so the, on, on the second question on the, on the contact details. I, I, I can put it on my next slides for the renewables part. Okay. Um, okay. And actually, on district heating and and uh, and PV, I have an example of uh, my use case is in the slides on the renewables uh, part of the webinar. So I don't know if the person who has the questions will stay for the second part, but I will give an example of um, of solar PV on industrial buildings and how thanks to that we managed to do district eating okay no i think you can we can wait for the second part which will start in uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes after a small break so yes we can leave it for the second part if the participant who uh, asked the question will not be able to participate i mean um, i can share can... with him the slides no problem about it Yes, yes, you can share it in the slides and, and the, the, the participant will, can uh, see the recorded webinars or uh, download the presentation in uh, just maybe in one week it will be ready. So I think we can leave it for the if second you, part of renewables. Okay. 
if you wish, I can give an answer on what is the what was the the case for the Thermos project. Uh, so yes, in, uh, yes, in this in this project, for example, for uh, the case uh, the use case of Spain, uh, there there was an installation of uh, photovoltaic and. Uh, so in order to um, being in Spain, so having a quite high um, solar uh, radiation during the day, um, they uh, and having a, a quite big district. So the, the, the Spanish uh, case was a, a residential district with uh, more than 500 houses, uh, um, self-managed and self-sufficient from the grid. So everything was uh, uh, from the the the, the heating. Uh, perspective everything was uh, produced uh, in a boiler room so they had the different technologies um, uh, biomass boilers gas boilers uh, and uh, for the um, the thermos project uh, we decided to install uh, um, an electric heat pump uh, so the electric heat pump was using the electricity produced uh, by the photovoltaic uh, in the not uh, peak consumption moments. So during the day when uh, uh, probably there is no so much request of uh, of heating, and uh, then this uh, um, the electricity was used in the in the heat pump uh, to produce hot water, and then the hot water was stored in a in a big tank. Uh, and also in uh, the same uh, district heating circuit, it was. Uh, Quite big. Imagine if uh, for 500, 500 houses is a quite a big pipe, so the amount of uh, hot water in the pipes was already quite high. So with the um, with the photovoltaic uh, and the heat pump combination, we were capable of uh, uh, saving approximately 20% of uh, gas consumption um, because we were covering mostly all the uh, heating losses that were going on the, during the day. So the heating losses were uh, going on due to due to this continuous circulation of the water in the pipe, which is quite a high um, heat consumption in the circuit. And uh, with the installation of the photovoltaic uh, combined to the heat pump, uh, we were able to cover all that heat losses for for free because it's energy coming from the from the sun. So that was uh, our case uh, that we experienced in the Thermos project. So welcome everyone uh, and hello Chiara. I see that you are on, on the on the on the phone. Um, so again, I'm, I'm Jules Cardio from Schneider Electric. So same people who did the, the presentation then during the first part. So representing Schneider to the European institutions here in Brussels. So just a quick short feedback: Schneider Electric is the leader in the digital transformation of the energy systems. And so basically we provide uh, solutions all across the value chains from buildings, industry, data centers, to make sure um, uh, those uh, sectors are more energy efficient, energy efficient, sustainable, and consume less energy. So uh, during this second part, um, uh, I will present you the EU strategy and frameworks when it comes to renewables. Um, uh, with one of also a best practice uh, we have as Schneider Electric uh, in Finland. Um, and then Chiara will present you also uh, the strategy as applied in Italy and a best practice from Italy. Um, as uh, highlighted during the, the previous part of the conversations, um, the EU, you know, has adopted during the previous uh, terms of between 2014 and 2020. Um, what we called the clean energy package, which was a package of eight legislative measures aimed to ensure Europe transitions to our sustainable uh, economies to accelerate energy efficiency and to boost renewables. So we have uh, moved uh, from um, uh, a previous uh, um, framework of renewables, which lies mainly in the renewables energy directive. So the original directives was from 29, uh, 2009, sorry, and uh, required the EU to fulfill at least 20% of its total energy needs with renewables by 2020. Um, and of course, this um, uh, target was not mandatory, but um, the, um, was the sum of the, of the individual national targets. So each EU member state has its own European 2010, 2020 targets, and they are different from one another. So of course, for instance, Sweden has uh, for uh, thousands of years, you know, I've, I've always, you know, um, put renewables uh, capacity at, at the core of, in, at, of its energy mix and didn't have you know, the same ambition uh, of country like Hungary, 
which uh, the, where the energy mix uh, depends less on, on renewables. So they are different targets, but the, the uh, attainment of those targets uh, aim to achieve 20% of renewable of uh, total energy uh, needs of the of Europe's based on renewables. So right now. We have 11 of the EU member states which have already hit their 2020 targets. Uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Italy as well. Hungary, Lithuania, Romania and Sweden. Um, but we are probably going to uh, fall short of uh, achieving the 2020 targets. Uh, I will come back uh, later to that. So first target from 2009, achieve 20% of, renewable of renewables in the energy needs of the EU by 2020. The second target uh, and the, uh, the updated target was adopted as part of the clean energy package and entered into force in December 2018. And member states have until next year 2021 to finalize the implementation of the directive. And the main element is that it sets out the obligations of abiding renewable energy target for the EU of at least 32% by 2030. So just for you to know, the original position of the Commission was uh, something between 27 to 30 percent. And because of pressure from the Parliament in particular, who are pushing for a 35 percent target and even 45 percent for center and political groups like the Greens, they have increased the targets to 32 percent. And uh, to make sure the EU um, uh, de delivers on this, uh, as part of the clean energy package, another piece of legislation was also adopted, which was called and which is called the governance regulations, which is basically the umbrella legislation to make sure that countries deliver. So they have the countries had until the uh, end of uh, 2020, 2019, so end of last year, to present their national energy and climate plans, which basically outline, outline how they are going to meet the different targets set out in the clean energy package including the energy efficiency directive and the renewable energy directive and right now uh, some member states have have not submitted yet their their national energy and climate plans including a country like france and germany and bulgaria and croatia as well so the commission uh, right now you know is pushing putting pressure on member states to say okay uh, now member states you need to present your plans on how you are going to achieve those targets um, and here you can see on this slide how the countries are doing uh, to achieve their 2020 targets. So as you know, the, as I explained you, the countries have different targets and uh, all those targets together aim for, uh, is aims at the EU to achieve 20% of, um, of energy, energy from renewable sources. So as you can see, countries like Sweden have already exceeded their targets. So the target of Sweden was 49% of renewables in the energy mix. And you have countries which, you know, have um, a smaller targets, but who also uh, achieve it, like uh, Hungary and uh, also uh, Cyprus and Republic Ch and, and Czechia, and also Italy. And also countries, you know, are quite um, away from their targets, including France, countries like France. So right now, the slow pace of development uh, means that the EU might not meet its 2020 targets. So we are right now between 18 to 20 to 20 percent, and EU is might fail short of meeting its 2020 targets. So failing might fail short of meeting the 2020 targets, but also uh, that means that we might be um, um, away from achieving the 2030 the 2030 targets. So. This slide to show you um, uh, in the light of this renewable energy directive what is you know the uh, gross electricity generation from renewable source in Europe and how you know what is the the different ways of uh, wind power, hydro power, and solar powers in the, uh, electricity, gen the electric electricity generation sorry from renewables. So today the uh, electricity generation from renewable energy sources contribute to more than one quarter of the total gross electricity consumptions. Hydro power is the most important source, followed closely by wind power and then solar power. And the other renewable energy sources will represent 20% of uh, the gross in electricity generation from renewables. 
include uh, electricity from wood, biogas, renewable waste, and geothermal energy. So that's basically uh, the different mix from renewables we have today in Europe. And uh, wind power and solar power are expected to increase, to increase since we see um, uh, increased capacities in a lot of countries, uh, including in north of Europe. And uh, the fact that the price of those solutions of solar powers has decreased considerably. And uh, for instance, at Schneider, we believe that uh, the price of solar and storage together means that by 2025, it will be cheapest than a barrel of oil. So really solar and storage becoming, you know, of course, the energy of the future. So we had this revision of the Renewable Energy Directive in 2018 uh, with the EU ambitions to become a global leader in renewable energy sources. And one of the uh, options which has been considered and which, is, which has been uh, discussed at the very important event yesterday in Brussels with the European Commissioner for Energy is, can we achieve a, a 100% renewables based energy systems by 2050. So that's one of the main issues and point of discussions today in terms of what is the EU strategy for renewables. But first, we will need to meet the 2030 targets. And as I explained, we are might fail short of achieving these targets. And we also need to achieve the 2030% target. The 2030 target, sorry, which is of 32%. So um, this is already, you know, uh, big to achieve and we are not on track at the moment at EU level to achieve this strategy and these targets. So now I'm, I will go into details of uh, what is this um, Renewable Energy Directive, which is, again, the main pillar uh, of the EU strategy for renewables. So first of all, we have with this new um, energy uh, renewable target, sorry, um, really important measures to accelerate self-consumption. So the directive has enshrined in EU law the right for uh, consumers to produce electricity using solar panels and to sell any excess productions to the grid and get a market price for it. So you have no discrimination of disproportionate charges. The electricity behind the meter is not charged except uh, for installations larger than 32 kilowatts. Uh, the risk of if there is a risk of financial instability and if there are electricity that benefits from support scheme from so from public support. Um, also the right from remuneration remunerations when feeding into the grids. And um, uh, another point I will come back later is really the fact that this directive is trying to make self-consumers active in the market with per purchase agreements, peer-to-peer -peer tradings, and other possibilities of DMI, so demand response. So that's basically the main measures of this renewable energy directive to uh, make sure um, we can uh, incentivize self-consumption. It's still, you know, and not enough, honestly, if you want to really incentivize self-consumption. But this is the first step from the EU to say, okay, now we need to enable self-consumption from renewables. Kara, uh, I, 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 did you have any questions? Because I heard some noise on your line, but. Uh... No, no, sorry. It no, was okay. just. Sorry, no, no, no problem about that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so if there are no questions, I'm moving to uh, the other slides um, uh, of this uh, renewable energy directive. And I also wanted to mention the electricity directives, which set measures, you know, to uh, enable the creation of local energy communities. So, um, and, and and apologize to that uh, because I, I don't know the, to which extent people on the phones are aware of uh, those local energy communities. I guess most of you are. Um, but the fact is that uh, in Europe, those energy communities are deploy, developing quite at a, a, a rapid pace and uh, at large scale in some countries. And the objective of this directive and of the EU was to say, okay, now we need to enable those energy communities you know to really become active consumers uh, not only you know to to generate electricity but then to sell it into the grid so what this renewable energy directives has set as principle is that um, energy communities are entitled to generate to sell and to store renewable energies so which means that the final consumers can participate in the renewable energy community that's the first right the second right is the right to produce consume, to store, and to sell renewable energy. 
And um, to do that, uh, the member states have the obligations to remove regulatory and administrative barriers. So I think we need to remain cautious on that point because this is just an obligation, but then um, it will be up to the member states to really enforce this directive. And um, important point to mention is that when it's a directive, the member states have some um, room for maneuver in terms of implementations. So we'll need to remain cautious on how well implemented these uh, points on removing regulatory and administrative barriers will enter into force at member state level. The second important part, is, uh, important part on the fact that the EU has tried to incentivize uh, local energy communities is part of the electric electricity market directive. So this was another pillar of the clean energy package aimed to, to, um, to uh, adapt, modernize the rules for um, electricity market in Europe and uh, you had provision on electricity sharings. So first of all, it prescribed what we can call citizen energy communities, which can be natural person, SMEs or local authorities, including municipalities. And this directive, um, which you know, kind of echo the provision in the Renewable Energy Directive, but in a more uh, uh, precise and um, uh, ambitious way, to say that uh, those communities uh, located in the same leagues or in the neighborhoods can trade, rent or purchase their own electricity distribution network. And this is very important in correlations with the Renewable Energy Directive because this is, you know, how you also incentivize energy communities. And for those communities, the network charge will apply by default, will not apply by default when electricity is consumed on locations. So important aspects on that is that the Commission estimates that by 2030, more than 50 gigawatt of wind and more than 50 gigawatt of solar could be owned by local energy communities. So that's a huge part, you know, of uh, the renewable energy sources which come from local energy communities, which, you know, again, confirm this trend and vision we have actually at Schneider that we are going to move to a much more decentralized energy systems where you have, we have a shift you know, away from the centralized generations and with much more decentralized uh, energy systems, in particular, thanks to the integration of renewables and the accelerations of the integration of microgrids. So that's the second important part of this directive on the measures for energy communities. Um, and then, uh, last but not least, important um, elements on the measure for public purchase agreements. So um, if you don't know what is a, purchase, a public purchase agreement, I guess you know, but I will go quickly on that, is direct contract with an energy generator towards the purchase of renewable electricity. And one of the biggest buyers of that is the corporate PPAs. And I guess you heard recently, and for instance, Google uh, claimed that, uh, claim being, you know, the largest corporate uh, buyers of, of renewable electricity, so have, they have um, open, um, they have signed, you know, a, a new PPAs to make sure that um, their facilities um, run only on renewable electricity. Um, so that's uh, an important uh, part, the PPAs, to help secure renewable energy investments and reduce deployment costs. And under this uh, revised directive, so the Renewable Energy Directive again, the member states have the obligations to facilitate the uptake of renewable PPAs. So first, they must access administrative and regulatory barriers. They make sure that there is no disproportionate procedure and charges, and they, make, they must make sure that they have, under the national energy climate plans, which I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, they must have policies and measures to boost PPAs. And again, as as a part of these PPAs, uh, they have new rules under the Renewable Energy Directives to um, uh, the guarantees of origins in tracking renewables and electricity. So the guarantees of origins, the goals uh, can provide traceabilities for electricity, which is very important, especially when the electricity is going to benefit from public supports. And they enable you know, the companies which invest in renewable electricity um, to make sure, you know, the um, electricity indeed com is coming from renewables and not, you know, from um, um, fossil fuels like coal. So that's a very important point to make sure renewables uh, um, uh, integrations accelerates in Europe 
uh, thanks to those public purchase agreements. Uh, and uh, I will end um, uh, this, uh, this part on the fact that uh, coming back to the Green Deal, uh, the EU uh, wants to really become a, a global leader in renewables. And here you have a quote from the new European Commission president explaining that, you know, they want to become climate neutral. And to do that, you will have to revise their all 2030 targets. So first Commission wants to be climate neutral, but also want to achieve 50% of CO2 emission reductions. And that's something very important for all of you to understand is that if we want to achieve these targets, we need to increase the energy efficiency targets and the renewable targets. If we don't do that, we will never achieve 50% uh, of uh, CO2 emission reductions by 2030. So you have uh, some um, uh, strategy as part of this Green Deal, the smart sector integration strategy, the strategy for offshore wind. I will go quickly on that and because we don't have a lot of uh, details at this stage of from the Commission. Um, and I, I'm happy to address some of your questions because we had a meeting yesterday with the European Commissioner for Energy. Um, so I'm happy to address your question later. Um, I wanted to go towards um, uh, uh, an, uh, a use case we have in Finland uh, to show you, you know, the, the potential of uh, integrations of renewables. Um, so we have this use case uh, of Lidl in Finland, which is the, the largest industrial microgrids in Finland. So this is a building that use 100% of renewables with solar panels. Um, and uh, thanks to that, we have a CO2 reduction goal of 40% by um, 2020. So uh, thanks to, um, um, I will show you a, a short video. I don't think you can hear the sound but you have subtitles which explain you a bit what is this project. Yes, yes, we can see the yep. video and but not hear the sounds anyway. Yeah, no problem. So quickly and, and then I will give the floor back to to Chiara because I think we should focus then on best practice but this is to give you a third of a view of what is you know energy efficient commercial industrial microgrid based on 100% renewable energy sources. So um, we basically you know deployed a, a, micro a microgrid operating on 100% renewable energy sources with uh, uh, 1,600 parallel solar power plants on the building roofs also a battery energy storage systems and thanks to the co-generation of heating and coolings uh, the heat recovered from the refrigeration equipments um, uh, enable us you know to participate in local demand response markets and to eat more than 500 private homes around these industrial microgrids and we will cut the co2 emissions by 40 percent and use 50 less per 50 less percent energy than current two operational centers so that's to give you, you know, a really a screenshot of how um, uh, of, of that we have already, you know, very good use case of renewable integrations and microgrids on being industrial microgrids and how this is by doing that kind of use case, you know, that we are really going to decarbonize Europe by accelerating the deployment of renewable energy sources and uh, the, the Lidl uh, center being uh, one of them. Uh, in Europe. Okay, thank you. So, hello everybody. Thank you, Jewel. Uh, so, just some few words to introduce myself. Uh, so, my name is Chiara and I work in Azero 2 Due uh, that is based in Rome, Italy. And uh, Azero 2 Due is a company created by the effort of two big ecologist associations in, in 2004, that are Kyoto Club and Lega Ambiente. Um, the, um, we, in a zero to do, uh, preserves uh, in our core business and policy, of course, the values of these two uh, big associations and 
me, I work in the uh, sustainable department, uh, so I'm involved in this moment in a project, in a main project uh, of forestation uh, in Italy, national forestation to mitigate the climate change. So thanks to Jules because uh, it was very interesting. Um, welcome also from my part to this uh, clean energy module. I will show you the uh, mainly the um, Italian uh, case um, and I'll try to give you the main information basically on how Italian legislation collect the European directives and carry it out at a local level because as Jules said of course we have to follow the main uh, framework European framework that's why I want to uh, start just from these uh, uh, slides because it's important to me to understand that of course the EU objectives are important and I want to focus on the um, main aims of the EU energy policies that as Jules says are a lot but one of the most important to me is to promote the, the one that said that promote the development of the new of new and renewable forms of energy to better align and integrate climate change goals into the new market design of course it is important but how to do that um, so we have one legal uh, basis that is the uh, article of the treaty of the functioning of the, of the European Union that uh, said that uh, some areas of the po energy policy are, uh, are shared competence. competence. What does it mean? It means that um, of course uh, it is important to um, have, to give the autonomy uh, to member states as Italy um, and the right to determine the condition of exploiting its energy resources. Uh, so it's choice between different energy sources and the general structure, uh, structure of its energy supply. Um, and I think this, it is uh, very important to us because of course we have, we have kind of the same goals, of course, we are going to the same uh, direction, but in different ways. Um, uh, this lies to make you understand that uh, the path is made by different steps, of course, also for the Europe part, because at the beginning, uh, let's say, uh, in 2014, the, um, the, the first uh, policy agenda said, okay, we have in, at the European level to achieve uh, the following goals for uh, by the 2030 and it was an, uh, the, 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 the one that we are talking is of course about renewable energy and it was an increase, underline an increase to 27% of renewable energies in energy consumptions. But um, then something has changed because the re revision of the Renewable Energy Directive uh, accelerated U Europe's transition towards clean energy. Um, um, creating a new target of 32% energy from renewable sources at EU level for 2030. So also from Europe we saw that uh, there were different uh, steps to um, reach the, the, the goal and to improve also the goal. Um, so the Italian goals uh, actually for 2030, um, we know that we have different levels, greenhouse gases reduction, energy efficiency, but uh, regarding the renewables, um, as we said and Jules said, the European Union has to achieve the uh, 32% and the Italy, as Jules said, just the 17% that we have already achieved. Um, so, it, um, of course, it is um, important to understand what is the uh, target and the binding target in this case um, and how we can use renewables to achieve new targets. So, uh, um, it is important to give some numbers also to understand um, what is the state of art in Italy. Um, so, uh, for the electricity sector, uh, in 2017, 
uh, approximately uh, the 35 percent of the national gross production came from uh, renewable, renewable energy sources. Um, this um, means that, of course, a lot of uh, national gross production came from renewable sources and uh, the most important one, as Jules said, from uh, the European level is the hydro one. Um, the 35% of the total electricity production from renewable energy sources was from the hydro one. Then, there was the solar sources, uh, solar source 23%, bioenergy 19%, wind power was 17%, geothermal 6%. I think we can say that as Jules pre uh, presented before, the slide is kind of the same. We have the same, not, not the same percentage, but the same amount of uh, uh, renewable energy utilized um but at the italian level so um also the thermal sector is important of course uh, it, uh, i mean um it was slightly less than 20 percent of total energy consumption ca that came from renewable sources based on the uh, date of uh, uh, 2017 um, we can say that approximately um, uh, 11.2 million tons of oil equivalent uh, uh, were um, was consumed by of energy of course was consumed by renewable energy sources there were mainly through individual boilers stoves fireplace solar panels heat pumps uh, and geothermal heat and the rest uh, was um, through district heating since systems powered by uh, mainly uh, biomass and some other uh, numbers <laughs> uh, the um, renewable source most used in 2017 for thermal consumption was solid biomass uh, solid biomass and another thing that uh, in, in, instead it pumps uh, that are also really important, um, but the contribution of bioliquid, biogas, geothermal, and solar sources are still limited. So we have to do more in this uh, sector for the um, thermal consumption. And uh, for um, the uh, regarding the uh, transport sector, that is of course very important. Uh, 1.2 million tons of biofuel were released for consumption, mainly biodiesel. So this is important as well. Um, uh, something more, yes. So uh, as I said, so the uh, we did a lot to. Uh, reach uh, um, the goal of 2020, we know that there is uh, the 2030 targets and uh, we are already thinking about the 2050 because it, of course it is important to organize and set out the targets. And so Italy is making an effort of course to equip itself with planning tools aiming at identified ob objectives, policies and measures consisted with the European framework to improve also the environmental sustainability, security and accessibility of energy costs. As Jules said, of course, we have to uh, create a plan for an integrated plan for energy and climate and climate at a national level, a level and we presented it uh i think like on december um but to arrive to the uh, integrated plan for uh, energy and climate at the national level we had before the uh, national energy strategy that was adopted in, in november 2017 that was not the point variable of course but the starting point for the preparation of this uh, integrated national plan um, i i think uh, it is important because of course it set out new target and also because it is in, um, it underlines not only the mission 
to uh, have uh, uh, to improve renewable energy sources to enhance uh, renewable energy sources but also uh, integrate this approach also with the environmental and socioeconomic sustainability so we of course have to reach the goal but to pay attention also to uh, the environmental and socioeconomic sustainability uh, i uh, mm, yes so um the main element of this plan for energy and climate that was presented to the European Union said that, of course, on one side, the evolution of energy system and its related targets would be per portion, uh, but how preserving environmental assets like air quality, landscape, land use, but and on the other side, side citizens and businesses will be involved in the transition process as uh, Jules said with his example no right so uh, promoting self self consumption energy communities monitoring energy bills and competitiveness of enterprises um, take into account that uh, we have the goal to promote at a national level so in Italy, the diffusion and the integration of renewable energy, uh, we can do that while minimizing environmental impact. Just to give you an example, how to do that, uh, giving priority to um, photovoltaic plants on building instead of uh, the area no? on the soil to preserve the soil, uh, use the heat pumps to avoid particulate emission create uh, um, advanced biofuels to use uh, waste and so to recycle and to create new uh, biofuels so it is important of course for Italy to um, follow the evolution of the energy system and its related target but don't forget to preserve environmental assets and um, and the sustainability uh, yes so um, in Italy um, we have uh, as I said um, different way to uh, <laughs> arrive to reach this goal uh, we know that of course we, are, we have to be more competitive it means uh, uh, aligning Italian energy prices with European ones to benefit uh, of both companies and consumers, no? right? And uh, create also new employment opportunities in the sector of renewables, be more sustainable, like contributing to decarbonization uh, in line, of course, with the long-term target of Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, more secure, uh, improving the security of energy supply while ensuring its flexibility. They are all linked, of course, with the, with the strategy of, uh, at the European level, but uh, they are uh, included in our national uh, strategy, in our integrated national plan. Um, so, um, the Italian uh, the government um, said, okay, um, we have to reach this goal. How to do that? We create uh, the incentives. Incentives to um, enhance the use of renewable energy sources. Thanks to this uh, um, decree, ministry decree, that was uh, launched in 2019, uh, July, uh, we have, uh, we, the, 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 the government, the Italian government, decided to promote, thanks to a financial support, the diffusion of plants for the production of electricity. Uh, the production of electricity from small, medium, and large size renewable sources. Um, so, which kind of renewable sources are incentivized by this decree? 
Um, so the plants that can benefit from the incentives um, are newly built photovoltaic onshore wind turbine, hydro plants and for the purification gas. Let's say that the decree divides the plants that can access the incentives into four groups based on the type. So, as I said, I could also the biography. So, of course, there are numbers inside. So, even if it's Italian, you can uh, read it. Um, in this slide, I just want to underline that, of course, there are these four groups group, group, group A that includes plants newly built on shore wind farms and newly constructed photovoltaics, group A2 that includes newly constructed photovoltaic system, but um, uh, photovoltaic system whose models are installed to replace roof of buildings so, and rural buildings on which there is the Ethernet or asbestos. asbestos. Uh, it means that you can remove this dangerous material from the roof and construct uh, the photovoltaic system instead. So this is very important. I mean, there was one incentive in the past that was more efficient, more efficient we can say, but it's still one uh, step <laughs> towards the, um, the photovoltaic system. Um, the group B includes plants that are newly built hydroelectric plants and the group C um, uh, is about onshore uh, wind turbines and hydropower with residual dust from purification process. So as I said before, if you want more information about it, I um, use the biography that is uh, sometimes in Italian, sometimes in English, but the numbers are <laughs> readable for everybody. Um, so, just some uh, information about the best practices in Italy because um, I think it is important also to um, speak about the, uh, the municipalities that in Italy have done uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of steps in this direction. And um, I decided to talk about the, uh, the municipalities in Italy because, um, as you might know, Italy is one of the countries ahead in the world in this perspective. And with the greatest opportunity, we are called um, City of Sun, something like this. And uh, of course, Italy is long and we have different sources uh, depending on the region where you are. Uh, so we have widespread and different renewable resources from now north to the south, um, which uh, of course can be enhanced and integrated in a local development perspective. I decided to uh, pick some example from the Lega Ambiente report. It's a report that uh, um, gives the opportunity to uh, unlight the uh, municipality and what they have done uh, by themselves um, to improve renewable energy sources in their in their uh, area. Uh, so the numbers are fundamental in the energy field, and uh, they are even more uh, important today that we need to stop the increase in the planet temperature. No? right in Italy, for example, we must travel by. Uh, at least tripled by 2030, the uh, 20 gigawatt installed of solar, solar system, and so make investment to reduce the energy consumption and the CO2 emission. Um, so uh, the, the, the report collects uh, the results the municipality they have, uh, the municipality have achieved um, and how. I just want to give you some numbers just to uh, let you understand uh, that uh, in uh, the data, I think there are of two 2017 or uh, 2018, um, but uh, we can say that in almost 8,000 Italian municipality were installed renewable energy sources. 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, there were 356. It means that a lot of steps 
toward this uh, um, the energy renewable energy source system are uh, were made um, so we can say that at least one photovoltaic system is installed in each Italian municipality. Uh, almost 7,000 solar thermal uh, system and 1,500 uh, 1, uh, mini hydroelectric system, in particular in the central north, because we have in the central north part of Italy a lot, a lot of uh, um, rivers and lakes. And then, uh, instead, in the center south, we have we have wind turbines, more uh, wind. Um, so another um, best practice I want to show you today is uh, uh, about a cooperative in Rome. If you have never been in ever been in Rome, you know that one of uh, the main problem is the um, the traffic jam. <laughs> Rome is big, uh, plenty of tourists, plenty of people, but the traffic jam is uh, very uh, on a high level. And uh, as you might know, the uh, air quality is uh, not at a high level because of the pollution made by the car. That's why uh, this cooperative of uh, cab taxi um, decide to uh, move to the electric electric mobility, uh, thanks to the collaboration with with the two leading companies in the car production market, so they have chosen to buy a hybrid car, uh, thanks to the partnership with Toyota, covering today about 80% of cars belonging to the uh, total amount of members, uh, taxi drivers. Um, they uh, cover, uh, let's say, in a working day, 120 kilometers, 130 kilometers, and adopted a hybrid car. Of course, all of there uh, allow them also to uh, have an economic saving. But um, uh, the positive effect it was not only from the um, economic point of view, but also from the um, environmental point of view, because of course there was uh, a, an important uh, amount of CO2 uh, uh, expresses, uh, of course, in ton of CO2 equivalent avoided by the use of these uh, electric taxes, uh, um, 163 uh, ton of CO2 avoided per year. Um, and also, what they did, they decided to put the uh, photovoltaic system in the cooperative headquarters. It means that uh, the cooperative headquarters, uh, as these uh, um, built in 2012, uh, the uh, photovoltaic system uh, on the shelter of the internal parking uh, with five columns that powered by the, the photovoltaic systems to uh, not only recharge the uh, taxes, but also to uh, cover the administrative office's uh, electrical needs with the, also the technical, the technical laboratory and multimedia room of the cooperative headquarters. It means that they became not 100% renewables, but almost, let's say. So um, I would say that even if uh, uh, we are we are looking <laughs> toward our goals that will be uh, always more um, important. Um, it is important the way in which we want to reach the goals, and uh, it is important also to give voice and underline all the efforts made made by, loc by the local, uh, at a local level, let's say. So even from uh, small municipalities, and Italy is plenty of small municipalities, and even from uh, cooperatives that want to um, help to reduce the greenhouse gas emission to um, enhance the energy efficiency, but more than other to 
use renewable energy sources because we are going to the same uh, path. We are on the same page on that. So um, that's why I, uh, I choose to uh, give you this best practice in Italy that are small and local because Italy uh, it's a, a local at local level is a, <laughs> it's a, has a lot of small reality and that's why I um, decide to show you that. So I think I I finished. Yes, thank you for your attention. Thank you for Jules because he gave me uh, the, the the opportunity to talk more about Italy, based of course on the European of uh, the European framework, legal framework. And um, thank you for uh, the attention to everybody. <laughs>